30 years ago, the ocean was a lawless place. With no one to protect it, the sea was being plundered, threatening the very balance of life. And to save the planet, it would take an outlaw. Yeah, this is Paul Watson. Nice to meet you. Confessions of an eco-terrorist. The epic tale of the world's most wanted environmental heroes. Captain Paul Watson and his vigilante organization, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Introduce you to Captain Paul Watson. I've got a statement here from our clients, so we're going to play that on the loudspeaker. Today we're sitting down with Confessions of an Eco-Terrorist director, Peter J. Brown, and regional coordinator for the Toronto chapter of Sea Shepherd, Bob Timmons. We'll talk about the film, whale hunting, and the dangers of fighting to save the ocean. We have been grammed. We've done a few bumpings ourselves. I call them oops moments, but um, we haven't shot at anybody, but Paul has been shot. I witnessed it. Uh, he had a bulletproof vest on, so, you know, it was kind of dramatic. Um, he didn't get hurt. The line I said was, well, good shot. <laughs> but I'm um, so lucky for him, they shot him in the chest and not in the head because he'd have been dead. But so we've had all those things. People, you know, it's very emotional. First of all, you're going out there and even though we always politely first ask them to stop, generally if it comes down to a confrontation and if you were two cars in a parking lot and somebody was going to come bump into you, you might uh, take offense and start doing some bumping yourself. And then, so it does escalate. We try not to escalate it. We call it aggressive nonviolence. We don't want to do the violence. Then you become them. You know, the violence is done to the animals, to the seals, to the whales, to the dolphins, to the oceans. We don't want to be the ones that do it. We want to be the ones to tell people it's time to stop. That's a really good question. First of all, whales on the whole are too full of, full of heavy metals to even eat. I mean, they're really unhealthy to eat. The Faroese who kill uh, whales every year, they themselves did a study of their children. They found that, that the eating of whale meat uh, affected the mental capacity of their children. That is their own study. Um, so everybody knows they're unhealthy to eat. Why do they still do it? I mean, it's hard to change traditions. Uh, I think in the Faroe Islands, sooner or later, they'll have to figure out they're not going to whale anymore. Um, the Japanese uh, actually started whaling basically after World War II. It was an American thing. MacArthur uh, started the first commercial whaling fleet in Japan um, to help feed the people after World War II. I don't, I'm against eating whale meat basically for reasons that I don't really think we should be wiping. First of all, we don't need it. Second of all, we shouldn't be wiping out the animal with the largest brain on the planet that we can't even come close to understanding, yet they can understand us. So I think it's really, you know, we've got to draw the line somewhere. And in saving the oceans, you have to pick uh, symbols anyhow. You can't, it's very hard to save a sea slug or, you know, something ugly. But you have to bring people to the table with something they care about. And people care about whales. If you're ever with a whale or in the presence of a whale, you feel it. There is a presence there. Most environmental films, you come out of them feeling like you want to shoot yourself in the head. When people come out of my film, they're actually laughing. Uh, they're planning their next thing. They want to get involved. And so I call it positive activism. I think when they watch 30 years of what we did and they see how much fun I had doing it, and it's so rewarding, not only for myself, but for others on the ship. I think people come away with the feeling that it's a rewarding thing to do. We are making an issue. We are making some progress. And there's room for everybody. Can't think of a better job. We actually, what we do is set up events. We raise money because Sea Shepherd is uh, run by donations. So that's the key is to generate more money for them and that's why we're here and we're set up to keep the awareness going of them, to keep people understanding why we need to protect the ocean and a good way to do it is to uh, support an organization like Sea Shepherd. Uh, I myself have been uh, to The Cove, uh, which is the documentary that won the Oscar and a, a few more other awards. And that's where dolphins are killed on the shores of Japan in Taiji. Actually, uh, 23,000 permits are put out, meaning 23,000 dolphins can be killed on the shores of Japan. And in Taiji, they kill almost up to 2,500. 
Uh, I've been there twice last year. So within the two campaigns I've seen, over 100, 100 uh, dolphins get slaughtered and probably, probably about 30 dolphins get put into captivity. And uh, they do their best to hide it. They have tarps that they're really trying to hide so you cannot see the actual killing of it. And they try and cover as much blood as they can because the water gets filled uh, blood red. It was very heartbreaking. You don't know how you're going to be. It is a different type of person that can witness this all the time. And you don't know how you're going to be until you're there. Uh, the second time I was there, it was more in the captive area because there's like four captive pens. Now, the, the big thing about Taiji isn't really, it's the slaughter, of course, yes, but what's funding it is not the slaughter. It's more of the captive industry because that's millions of dollars and that's servicing uh, dolphin, dolphin shows around the world, dolphin, swim with dolphins in your vacation parts. Those, those animals do not come there willingly. They come there through some sort of violent action. And in this case, it's, uh, Taiji is one of them. So uh, that was a very heartbreaking one because that was more intense because we had to monitor all these pens and see the sadness of these animals. And they had to starve them for the first little while to, so they could start eating dead fish because these animals don't eat dead fish. And that's how they had to do it. And then they would use that as a way to train them. Well, it's become my life. It's become my lifestyle and everything I do, I find ways on putting out the message. And to being, being a part of Sea Shepherd, I have at least an organization that I can really be a part of and share what they're a part of. I, I want to say that uh, Sylvia Earl is a, an amazing lady who's a marine biologist, and she put out, without the blue, there is no green. And, and that's so true, like I said earlier. And there, there is probably 90% of the sharks are gone. 90% uh, of our coral reefs are probably gone. But she says, there's still 10% to protect. And that's, that's what we need to educate and have a group of people, the, the, the world population, to start protecting. Because without that, then if the, the ocean dies, we die. So you have to start small. You don't have to start saving the world. And you will find that as you have some success, you don't always have success. You don't always win. I mean. You know, if you're going to stand up for your passion, history tells us that you're going to get hurt. So get used to it. Get over it. You know, you have to get up after you get whacked and go back and fight them again. Because we have to keep fighting. If not for ourselves, I mean, I'm kind of old and, you know, I'm not going to be around. I'll see plenty of whales and there's enough air for me to breathe and I still have water while I'm living. But I have children and they have children. And, you know, the Iroquois Nation used to make all the decisions on seven generations down the road. If it didn't, you know, they think, okay, what am I going to do today? Is it going to, how is it going to affect seven generations? Well, humans today should take that up because what we are doing in my generation is really messing with your generation.